In Western Christianity, much is said of the missionary campaigns of St. Paul and St. Peter. These missions are the focus of much of the content of the Bible's New Testament and set the foundation for the Christian church. Another disciple of the resurrection was St. Thomas the Apostle. According to tradition, Thomas went east and established Christianity in Asia, as far as India and China. The Church of the East, sometimes referred to as Nestorian Christians, were a little group spanning vast geographies and peoples. By the 12th century, stories of a Christian king in the East named Prester John began to gain in popularity and spread throughout Europe. By the end of the century, the hope of Prester John coming from the East to assist the Western Christians in their campaigns in the Holy Land increased due to the successes of Saladin. In the early years of the 13th century, saw the dawn of the Fourth Crusade. Called by the powerful Pope Innocent III, the campaign relied heavily on the money and naval power of the Republic of Venice. However, the ruler of Venice, the Doge, a Venetian form of the Latin word dux, or English duke, called for an attack on the city of Zara in modern-day Croatia and, at the time, part of the Kingdom of Hungary. This attack on another Christian kingdom was followed by an advance on Constantinople. The Fourth Crusade ended up sacking the Byzantine Empire and installing a Latin emperor of Byzantium. Christians attacking Christians was certainly not the intent of the campaign. The Fifth Crusade followed in 1217 and resulted in nothing positive for the Christians against the Muslims. However, new tales of Prester John emerged. It was said that his son, or perhaps his grandson, was advancing on Persia, conquering lands, and poised to conquer the Muslims next. The story of a conquering army was, in fact, true, but it was not a descendant of Prester John, it was Genghis Khan. The Mongol Empire would seriously challenge the Muslim caliphates in the Levant, while also conquering across the Russian steppe and into Eastern Europe. The death of Genghis Khan in 1227 splintered the Mongols into different groups. The powers of Western, Western Christianity would continue to seek alliances with the Mongols throughout the 13th century in their attempts to reconquer the Holy Land. Welcome to the History of Modern Politics. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you so much for being here with us today. We are taking a look at the development of our modern politics from the Roman times to the modern, and we appreciate you being here. If you are a member of History of Modern Politics Plus at historyofmodernpolitics.com, you can get the video, the show notes, you can get our reading lists, and find all kinds of great content, including ad-free shows monthly. It's an advance. So we started this project in, gosh, we are recording this in November of 2021. We started this project in March. We're on episode 11. All of those are available if you are listening uh, on the public, free public feed right now. You can hear 12 and 13 already if you go over to History of Modern Politics plus uh, historyofmodernpolitics.com. Excuse me. My name is Chris Spangle. The name that you, the, the voice that you just heard <laughs> is that of Matt Whitliff. Talking hey, to you hey, about Chris. Yep. How are you? Yep, doing well. Thank you. And today we're talking about roughly the dates of 1225 to 1268. And we're starting to enter some wild, turbulent times in the 1200s and the 1300s. Uh, exciting times to be sure as we focus in on England and the Plantagenet dynasty. Uh, coming up, we have the three Edwards, which they're all nuts. Uh, but we are going to talk a little bit more about the significant changes in England, the growth of law, the establishment of parliament, and an increasing counterbalance in the power of the barons against the king. And while the king still reigned supreme in England, the legacy of Magna Carta was consistently revisited as powerful lords aimed to keep the king away from absolute power. I.e., stealing all of their all of their stuff <laughs> and their money and their women. Now, during most of the century, King Henry III reigned when his death culminated in a 56-year reign, unmatched until King George III in the 18th century. Yes, that King George. Mm -hmm. uh, as we'll see in today's episode, Henry III was not a particularly strong king, and even was even imprisoned by rebels at one point. Uh, but. Today, we're going to follow our usual course of English history, Matt. Yep. Yep. We'll take that and we'll go through, you know, the, the royal lens that we've been kind of doing in the last few episodes, kind of hitting one king at a time, um, or in some cases, a couple of kings, right? But today, we're really just going to focus on Henry III. He doesn't get as much attention uh, in, in when you read other histories and, and um, 
listen to various podcasts and books, things like that. But uh, it's an important period. So we're going to dig deeper into Henry III's reign, deeper into the broader nobility and try to start to introduce a wider array of characters that really help establish par- parliamentary democracy, which is obviously in England here first. Um, but, you know, the descendants of which we have today throughout most of the, the Western world. So there's no turning back really from these these events. Um, and, you know, we'll see civil wars. And actually, in many future episodes, eventually, we get a true uh, parliamentary republic of a king. But we'll have to wait a couple hundred years before we get to that point, Chris. Right. So let's talk about some of the key provisions of the Magna Carta. We talked about its development last time, but now we're going to get into the weeds of it. You've heard it in seventh grade, and now you can learn it again <laughs> uh, because you didn't learn it the first time like I didn't. Uh, Now, as we noted in the last episode, the original Magna Carta was doomed to fail from the start due to the security clause, which was breached in a manner of months leading up to the First Baron's War by King John. And the Magna Carta would be reissued in 1217 and 1225 without this provision and a handful of other modifications. Now, before we get into the timeline of our today's episode, let's cover a summary of the clauses and review of a few of the most important ones in political history. Now, as we'll learn in today's episode, the Magna Carta continued to be affirmed by the king on occasion, and it was also fully reissued again in 1297, which we'll cover next time, with nearly the same text as the 1225 version. So it changes in in, in content from the various iterations from 1215 until 1225, and they're the most interesting to study. So historian Richard Cassidy has a nice breakdown of how the clauses of the charters can be summarized and mapped version to version. We'll use his work today to help summarize some of this. Now, the clauses, Matt, break down into what categories? Yeah, roughly we have a handful of categories. So we have the church, we have family and property, we have taxes and service, legal manners, uh, matters, excuse me, local government, towns and trade, the forest, and then, you know, topical issues, which is kind of the miscellaneous grab bag category enforcement and security so throughout each version of the magna carta there's really just one clause that deals with the church uh and historians believe that this was likely authored and obviously very heavily influenced by archbishop of canterbury stephen langton who we met last episode he was also probably pretty influential over all of the final text of the 1215 version the original version of the charter the the contribution on clause one uh, which is, you know, obviously the first clause, right, of Magna Carta, really sets the foundation and establishes religious liberty of the church and lays the foundation for that important principle of freedom of religion that uh, carried on, you know, all uh, influencing the American Revolution, the Bill of Rights, and all of that such, right? Uh, so this is one of only a few clauses that we're going to actually, uh, that actually remains part of British law today. This is actually still in force and effect as part of British law. We'll read here in part. First, that we have granted to God and by this present charter have confirmed for us and our heirs in perpetuity that the English church shall be free and shall have its rights undiminished and its liberties unimpaired. That we wish this to so to be observed appears from the fact that of our own free will before the outbreak of the present dispute between us and our barons, we granted and confirmed by charter to the freedom of the church's elections, a right reckoned to be the greatest necessity and importance to it and cause this to be confirmed by Pope Innocent the third, this freedom we shall observe ourselves and desire to be observed in good faith by our heirs in perpetuity. Yeah. And, and to recap the, the Kings, the plan, you know, Henry, the second Richard, the Lionheart, Uh, But especially King John had used the church as a weapon, had stolen much of when the interdict was issued. For instance, King John stole much of the wealth of the English church. uh, And Henry II had tried to uh, usurp the power of church courts and prosecute uh, clergy. And so they needed to establish their own independence. And so now... Moving on in the original clauses to 11, 15, 27, 32, you can see all that in the show notes, all the different clauses. I won't I won't uh, list them all here. Um, they dealt with family of property. Now, by the 1225 version, 14 of the 36 clauses remained in the family and property category. This is really at the heart of the Magna Carta, and it deals significantly with aspects of feudalism as it relates to marriage 
debt, inheritance, and wardship. Now, most of these were revised in, or repealed in 1863, but the language around debt, which prevented the crown from seizing land or properties that satisfy the debt uh, of a debt, survived until the revisions in 1969. It is important to not understate the importance and relevance of these clauses to the time. These are not the famous clauses that survive today, but these set a balance of power such that the king, and importantly a corrupt one like King John, is restrained in his ability to exploit the barons and their family because, Matt, they would just declare, um, mm, you owe me this, and now I'm going to take your castles because you snubbed me at a at, at a court, right? Uh, and I don't like you now because I changed my whim today, so I'm taking your castles, right? Or you know, you, you want to marry, have a marriage between your oldest daughter and this uh, son of another baron. You're going to have to pay us twenty thousand pounds to make that happen, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I, Braveheart talks about prima nocta. I don't know that that actually ever happened in English history, but that's you know the level of <laughs> the feeling and hatred that they sort of had. So the 1215 version of Magna Carta had four clauses that dealt with taxes and service, with service here primarily being some form of service due to the king in lieu of or in addition to paying rents or taxes on land held. Um, now, interesting, Clause 14 essentially called for a king to call a council in order to set a new tax. So they couldn't just impose a new tax to go on a crusade. This would create a precedent, which we will see later in this episode for Parliament. However, the clause did not survive past the 1215 version. The surviving clauses seek to put a ceiling based on longstanding custom as to what constitute rents and knights' fees from land held. That's right. Uh, and then move into the next, you know, kind of prolific category in terms of the content of uh, Magna Carta was that of legal matters. 14 of the original 62 clauses, nine of the final 36 in the 1225 version. You know, most of these clauses are, you know, established, agreed upon principles for how royal cart courts are going to operate and what their interaction is going to be with other local and baronial courts. So, if you remember the divisions, counties, and shows down into hundreds. I mean, there were still hundreds of courts in county courts. Hold on and, just a second, Matt. Yeah. So start over with there were hundreds. So if you recall, there were, you know, shires and hundreds within the shires. And so there were courts for, you know, the hundreds and and even, uh, you know, landed manors held by a baron had a baronial court. Right. So. All all of these clauses have to do with how the legal uh, operations of the, the royal courts would interact with the various other courts. Uh, the most famous of the clauses, however, is uh, combined into clauses 39 and 40 and was reduced to just uh, one clause in the 1225 version. But this also remains as part of British law today and cements the very important principle of habeas corpus. It reads, no free man is to be taken or imprisoned or deceased of his free tenement or of his liberties, or free customs, or outlawed, or exiled, or in any way ruined, nor will we go against such a man, or send against him to save by lawful judgment of his peers, or by the law of the land. To no one will we sell, or deny, or delay right or justice. So there are three clauses in the 1225 version, and seven in the original that deal with local government. These mostly concern what country authorities such as the sheriff, constable, and bailiffs are allowed to do. And there are five original clauses, and four of which remain in 1225 that deal with towns and trade. These give protections to merchants, including foreign merchants, to establish uniform weights and measures and acknowledge London's special status to, quote, enjoy all its ancient liberties and free customs. In fact, while London is called out, it does specifically grant the same to other cities, boroughs, and towns and ports. This is the third and final clause of Magna Carta that still remains British law. Now, there are three clauses in the 1215 Magna Carta dealing with the forest. Now, these were mostly removed in the 1217 version and added to a separate charter of the forest, which would be reaffirmed along with Magna Carta time and again over the years. The principle here was to roll back the lands that had been identified as royal forest from any time since the reign of Henry II. It promises also to abandon, quote, all evil customs relating to forests that had begun under the reign of King John. Now, remember, the reason this is important is that most of Britain was forest and a lot of that was claimed by the king. So if you were starving and wanted to go out and hunt a deer, it was a capital offense in some instances. 
So it was it was a matter of, you know, getting your own food <laughs> in yeah. your own locality because this one rando over, you know, in Winchester had declared that this forest 400 miles away was his. Didn't make any sense. So they were establishing the right to hunt, essentially. Yeah. And there's eight clauses in the original version dealing with these topical issues. Most of these have disappeared by the 1217 version as they were really specific to issues around hostages and foreigners and mercenaries that were going on in the current events of 1215. Uh, in the 1225 version, in fact, there's no remaining clauses that we would identify as topical issues. And similarly, you know, we discussed the famous security clause, which doomed the 1215 version. Uh, it did not persist in future versions. Uh, it, it wasn't there. However, the 1217 version does include a new clause regarding the, quote, saving of liberties, uh, which emerged uh, into the 1225 version, as well as a grant of taxation of a 15th to the king. So it's worth reading this clause uh, also in part as we wrap up the review of the original contents of Magna Carta. We're going to read the 1297 version here for this clause. It says, all these aforesaid customs and liberties which we have granted to be held in our realm insofar as it pertains to us to are to be observed by all of our realm, both clergy and laity, insofar as pertains to them in respect of their own men. For this gift and for the grant of these liberties and the others contained in our charter over these liberties of the forest, the archbishops, the bishops, abbots, priors, earls, barons, knights, fee holders, and all of our realm have given us a 15th part of all of their movable, movable goods." Moreover, we grant to them for us and our heirs that neither uh, neither we nor our heirs will seek anything by which liberties contained in this charter might be infringed or damaged. And should anything be obtained from anyone against this, that is to count for nothing and to be held as nothing. So really, hey, we're giving you the Magna Carta. We're protecting your liberties, but we're going to tax you. As always. Uh, now, the barons seek to constrain the king. It, it's going to lead to a lot of different revolutions in government like the provisions of oxford the provisions of westminster the second baron's war the statue of marlboro and many other things now as we prepare prepare for the events of the mid 1200s which lead to the flood of these various legal events let's better understand the class structure of the time matt and more importantly the leading barons who wield power for and against the king now it's often remarked that the class structure in the middle ages can be summarized as quote those who worked, those who fought, and those who prayed. This is definitely an oversimplification, but it's helpful to frame the discussion. Again, that's workers, fighters, and prayers. Now, those who worked would be essentially the peasants and merchant class who did not hold the title to land as a baron and thus worked generally as a vassal to a baron. Those who fought would be the baronial class who held land as a fief from the king they would enjoy the income of their land, pay dues to the king, and would be responsible for supplying men-at-arms to fight on behalf of the king. And as we noted in the last episode, this was sometimes avoided by paying scootage, and by this era was definitely getting more complex than simply those who fought. Um, I would also add that criminals often were making up, there's as much as probably 10% in the War of uh, the Hundred Years' War that's upcoming that were just criminals seeking a pardon. Uh, so they'd empty the prisons and send them off to France. Yeah, that's not going to end well, Matt. Uh, <laughs> finally, we have those who prayed, which would range from the bishops to the priests and include deacons, minor clergy, and those of monastic orders. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so first off, at the top of the Lord's spiritual, we have the four archbishops of this time. So the Archbishop of Canterbury, who we've met that title and role multiple times. We also have an Archbishop of York, the Archbishop of Dublin, and the Archbishop of Bordeaux, which, of course, corresponds to the lands of Aquitaine, primarily Gascony, uh, which were still retained by King Henry III, even after the losses sustained by King John in the early 1200s. Below the archbishops, of course, you have the regular bishops and then the abbots. Uh, these are the head of a particular diocese and the abbots uh, being the heads of monasteries. There were 16 bishops abbots from across England that were really considered part of this upper crust class of the uh, Lord spiritual. As a reminder, a bishop typically also holds land as a tenant in chief like any other baron. And the land itself was an ecclesiastical holding with the cathedral being its center as opposed to a castle. Now let's uh, move on to the yeah. Lord's Temporal. We have the Earls. If you remember, an earldom is analogous to a county led by a count. Uh, 
in French feudalism. And Earl was the highest rank outside of the immediate royal family. And you'll recall that as some sons come of age under a living king, they're usually granted the title of count or earl of some land. The earl was notionally the king's leading representative in the county, outranking the sheriff or justicar. But the earl did not hold the entire county as a fief. The barons who held lands in a given county owed some deference to the earl, but still paid direct homage to the king. The earl typically owned manors in other counties as well. In England, there were 39 counties, of which about half had an associated earldom. In addition, there were four counts in Gascony, the Earl of Pembroke, which covered the territories of Wales, the Earl of Ulster, co covered Ireland. And I I'd also add that some sometimes they had counties in France and England, which uh, right. would cause all kinds of tension. Now, a quick side note, to try to put the feudal system in the modern context, the best way to imagine this would be if a CEO of the most powerful companies were also the governors of their state and held the rank of general in the army. So imagine Zach, uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg is the uh, also the governor of California and the head of the state guard. These are truly powerful individuals at the top of society. Now, remember, the economic system is still largely agricultural, with those who work in the land retaining only small amounts with wealth funneling up the system to the tenants in chief and ultimately the king. That's right. So beyond the most powerful earls, or excuse me, powerful barons, the earls, there's also many other additional barons. And this number is a bit fluid um, as we look at like the early 13th century here. But around this time, there's a couple hundred barons and various unlanded lords who hold who hold you know title in that throughout the domains of the king. So if we look at the struggle between Henry III and the baronial opposition, it was made up of various factions with shifting loyalties. And before we get to those barons, we do want to start with like the king. So you'll recall from our last episode, Henry III assumed the crown at the young age of nine in the midst of the first barons war and was under the regency of our favorite knight earl william marshall and when marshall died he passed the regency to a three-man panel this led to infighting and conflict notably between peter de roche and hubert de berg uh, henry the third took over formal control of his government in 1227 invading france in 1230 in an attempt to regain some of the losses of his father uh, but that quickly ended with henry the third agreeing to a truce with king louis the ninth of france who was the grandson of Philip II that we met last episode, son of Louis VIII, who had only a brief reign, uh, and he was the one that was invited to come conquer England in the Barons' War. So Henry III lacked, lacked uh, the strength in military affairs and really didn't have that, that, quote, energy, right, that we've heard about from the Angevin kings of traveling throughout his kingdom or as how the Normans did as well. Um, he, he was pious. He developed this deep affinity to... Edward the Confessor, you know, almost treating him like this absent, glorified father figure that he never really had because, <laughs> you know, King John was his dad. That's yeah, not a great not a example. Great yeah. uh, and then, you know, de Berg and, and de Roche, you know, often manipulated him for power. So he, he really lacked a strong father figure and decided to make Edward the Confessor his his father figure. Uh, spent vast sums of money on on Westminster Abbey. Uh, really wanted the crown to be viewed with the dignity and respect that he felt it should have. And he, you know, through that vastly increased all the ceremonial aspects of royalty. So if you think of all the grandeur and splendor of, of the modern Kings or what you think of as like, you know, middle, late middle age, uh, 1600s type of thing of the kingdom uh, or of the royalty. Uh, a lot of that started with Henry the third here. Um, pomp and circumstance if you will yeah as dough-headed as he was uh he, he re this really seemed like a period of stability and peace in terms of the um the plantagenets i mean once you get to the edwards it's not it's it's all downhill after henry the, it's, it's downhill to henry the third and then even more downhill after henry the third yeah well all all the fun we will see so um anyways he he, he did was viewed as having that weaker personality but uh he he did do a decent job with that balancing act, trying to, you know, work through that. Um, but part of that was he always seemed to be agreeing with whoever the last person to advise him <laughs> was, right? Which didn't lead to, uh, you know, a strong, strong, uh, you know, relationship with the barons, right? Because he never knew who he was going to side with. Um, and he also didn't have any success militarily. So uh, that really sums up kind of the character of Henry the Third. 
So now he goes on to marry Eleanor of Provence in 1236. She came up from a noble French family, and her father was Count of Provence, and her mother was the daughter of the Count of Savoy. Both Provence and Savoy are in modern-day southwestern France, but were at the time part of the Holy Roman Empire as a quasi-independent state, and Eleanor's parents were quite the power couple in negotiating marriages. Eleanor had no brothers, but her three sisters married King Louis the Fourth, ninth, 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 ninth of yeah. France. Sorry, Roman numerals, and I don't get along. <laughs> Henry the Third's brother Richard, who would later be elected King of the Germans, and Charles of Anjou, who would eventually be King Charles of Sicily. Now, Eleanor would bring with her to England an honorage of her relatives, including two powerful uncles, Peter, who would be given the title of Earl of Richmond, and Boniface, who became the Archbishop of Canterbury. The presence of her relatives at court would be called the Savoyards, and they became a point of growing contention for the native English lords. Go ahead. Yeah, so Henry III's mother then also comes into the picture in the dynamics of court. So you recall King John married Isabella of Angoulême in 1200. Shortly after the death of John and the coronation of Henry, she returns to France, marries Hugh of Lusignan, and the Lusignan family was from Poitou, which had been part of Aquitaine and lost to, to the French by King John. So we didn't cover this in the last episode, but John and Isabel actually had five children together. We've already mentioned the two sons, uh, Henry III, of course, and, and Richard, but they also had three daughters who would go off to marry the kings of Scotland, the Holy Roman Emperor, and the son of William Marshall. Uh, however, Hugh and Isabel would go on to have nine children together, leaving King Henry III with quite a large group of half-siblings in France. Isabel and Hugh tried to break their fealty to King Louis IX unsuccessfully, and upon her death, with all the ongoing tension between the Lusignons and King Louis, Henry III invites all of his half-siblings to come to make a new home in England. Hmm. And so this new entourage creates yet another faction of foreigners at court that further irritate the native English lords. Seems like that would be unpopular. It was a little unpopular. Yeah. And and remember, there's still like Henry the Third is still speaking French. Like English yeah. is not the official uh, state language by any, you know, this is still the William the Conqueror stamp still exists, um, you know, absolutely two, 300 years later. So in 1239, Henry and Eleanor had their first child whom they named Edward. This was certainly an homage to Henry the Third's favorite predecessor, Edward the Confessor. Now, this was a surprising choice of name as Edward had died out in usage amongst the nobility. It was like bringing back Eckbert or Ethelstan or Ethelwald. Edward was married in 1254 to Eleanor of Castile, the half-sister of King Alfonso X of Castile, when Henry III felt the threat of Spanish incursion in his lands in Gascony. Now, with this political alliance, border tensions were quelled, and Edward added to his land holdings across Gascony, which will play a big role uh, in the future, Ireland, Wales, and England. However, lieutenants were in place to manage nearly all of his lands, leaving him with very little income of his own as he was coming of age. Edward had periods of influence in his childhood and teen years from foreigners at court, as well as first the Savoyards and the Lusigans. And by the 1250, Edward was eager to be his own man, much like the sons of Henry II. That's right. So before we get to these key events in the 1250s and 60s, we want to take this opportunity now to help get to know the powerful barons and families of England at the time. If you, if you go off on your own and do any research or read any books or listen to podcasts that cover this era, you're going to hear these names, you know, quite a bit. So we want to give you a kind of a cursory tour of these folks um, of England at the time as they were big influencers of uh, of the, you know, what was going on, right? Just like senators, governors, business leaders of today. So these names, families are all going to kind of come in and out of our storyline going forward. And, um, and so let's, let's get started, right? So we'll start with the earldom of Chester. Chester's located strategically up on the northeastern border of Wales and health, hence is referred to as a march, which is an old word for border. So this is a unique earldom having the classification called a county palatinate, which actually gives the earl much more autonomy to rule compared to other earldoms, almost like, a, you know, again, a quasi-independent um, uh, county, if you will. So this initial grant of this status was given to Chester back by William the Conqueror, who invested the title to a powerful Norman family led by his half-sister's son. And the rule of Chester passed to the re a related family after the White Ship disaster, if you remember that, from uh, episode oh, eight or seven, seven, the anarchy, right, uh, who invested the title uh, as the powerful Norman 
family, um, you know, oh, sorry, let's back up there. So the rule of Chester then relate, passed to a related family after the white ship disaster and remained there with loyal supporters of the crown until Edward, yes, that son of the king who we were just talking about, was given the lands as Lord of Chester in 1254. Now, the de Burgh family, almost certainly another Norman family, came from obscurity in the late 12th century. William de Burgh received grants of land in Ireland, and his descendants eventually held the tiled, title the Earl of Ulster. Their last name would evolve to Burke, the very common family surname that you have heard, and they will come into play more in the next episodes. William's younger brother, Hubert, was one of King John's most loyal deputies, serving as chief justicar in the last couple of years of his reign during the turmoil of the First Barons' War. Now, he continued as chief justicar and was a key player in the regency of Henry III with William Marshall and Peter de Roche. Hubert was married, it's probably Hubert, uh, in the parlance of the time, Uber. was uh, Uber, was married for about a month to King John's first wife and then married the sister of the King of Scotland. When Henry III gained control of the kingdom after the coming of age, Uber was given the title the Earl of Kent. This was not hereditary, and he was the only person to hold this title during the 13th century. The de Bowen family is yet another family of Norman origin with lineage tracking back to the compatriots of William the Conqueror. The family sided with Empress Matilda during the anarchy and was awarded the er title Earl of Hereford under King Henry II. Herefordshire is another county in the Welsh marches, and the de Bones were elevated to a hereditary position, the Lord High Constable commanding the royal armies. The de Bones were opposed to King John in the First Barons' War, uh, but continued to re retain the hereditary title over Hereford, the constable, and ultimately added the title uh, Earl of Essex in 1239. The Bigod family, B-I-G-O-D, family also had roots in the Norman Conquest, after which the family was awarded lands in East Anglia, mostly in Norfolk and Suffolk. Hugh Bigod was named the Earl of Norfolk in 1141 by Empress Matilda, whom he supported for a while after previously supporting King Stephen. He then initially had favor with Henry II, but supported the rebellion of Henry the Young King in the family feuds we covered in episode 10. His son Roger was a key supporter of King Richard and was later sympathetic to the baronial cause against King John. His son Hugh married William Marshall's oldest daughter, and the descendants would then inherit the hereditary title Marshall of England. After all, William Marshall's after all of William Marshall's male descendants died without issue in 1245, meaning no sons. By the mid-1200s, the Bigot family included Roger, Earl of Norfolk, Marshall of England, and Hugh, who was the chief justicar. In southeast England, we have Surrey, home of the de Warren family, another noble family that gets its start with the Norman as a Norman companion of William the Conqueror. The de Warrens were uh, usually loyal royalists, and uh, among the most prominent mem members of the family, Isabella held the title of countess, ruling Surrey in her own right for many years, and she married the son of King Stephen and the second half uh, half brother of King Henry the Second. Now, the next family is that of the Declares. They, too, have Norman origins. However, their family line traces back to the early Dukes of Normandy. Richard Declare, the third Earl of Hertford, just north of London, married the granddaughter of Richard, Earl of Gloucester, a, the, legitimate, the illegitimate son of Henry I and half-brother of Empress Matilda, who was a major player in the campaign during the Anarchy. This merged the two earldoms into a powerful family who subsequently held the title of both Earl of Gloucester, and the Earl of Hertford. They generally sided on the sides of the barons against the power of the king. Robert Fitzwalter, the leader of the rebel barons in the First Barons' War, was a member of the Declare family descended from a younger brother of the main line. And finally, we have Warwick Castle, the seat of the Earl of Warwick, situated somewhat in the center of England, and this title was held by the Norman de Beaumont family since the times of William the Conqueror. The de Beaumonts were loyal to the king and often on the royalist side of King Henry III in the upcoming conflicts. The title would pass to the related de Beauchamp family in the later course of Henry III's reign, who were strong allies of Lord Edward. In addition to the title Earl of Warwick, 
The, the Beaumonts would also hold the title Earl Lester through another line of sons from the first de Beaumont. And the fourth Earl Lester was a companion of Richard the Lionheart on the third crusade. He would be captured and imprisoned by the King Philip II of France. During this time, the lands in Lester would pass to his sisters with the earldom eventually passing to the children of her, the eldest sister's husband, Simon de Montfort. That crazy son of a... We'll stop there and return to Simon de Montfort in just a moment. There are a few other key families, but these are the most powerful and relevant at the moment. And we'll introduce others as we go. But before we go on to our main storyline, it's helpful to call out the primary political lines that are beginning to take shape between the factions generally loyal to the kings and those who tend to fall into opposition. This mostly falls on family lines. There are also a lot of marriage alliances that take place among noble families. You now see why marriage is so important in this era, because it is where it's networks of power. If you recall from our discussion on the contents of the Magna Carta as direct vassals to the king, these families had to get permission directly from the king to arrange marriages, and they also paid fees to get that done, because obviously the king wanted to say in where those networks of power were moving. Absolutely. Now, now, yeah, the other now, thing I want to just quickly yeah, call out, Chris, right, that it's really obvious as you go through all of these most powerful families, like they almost all, if not all, exclusively trace back to William the Conqueror yeah. and, and Norman families that came over, right? So when we talk, we've talked in the past episodes about the nobility being essentially French, like there you go, right? I mean, these are all well, Norman there's a families reason that, that came over. Yeah, the most, some of the most powerful people in our society go to Yale and Harvard. And, you know, here in Indiana, they they went to IU and they went to the Kelly School of Business. And then one person gets successful and recruits their other friends and recruits the people that they knew from their past. Like networks of power still govern modern politics. It always has. And that's part of the, the, the conversation around inclusion is helping people who are outside of networks of power start to get into that stream and allowing people who are at a disadvantage to get access to networks of power. Absolutely. So let's get into that political crisis now, finally, of the mid 13th century in England. And to do that, we're going to start with the death of Frederick II, the Holy Roman Emperor in, in 1250. So Henry, if, excuse me, Frederick II was son of Henry VI and Constance, who we met in the last episode in episode 10. Henry VI used that massive ransom that he secured uh, from the capture of Richard the Lionheart to conquer Sicily and install his wife as rightful queen and ruler. So at this point, Henry VI domain as Hen the Holy Roman Emperor was huge. Uh, he, But his early death then creates a succession crisis that puts the powerful German princes into factions, all while that Pope Innocent III, that powerful Pope, comes into power. So the absence of a Holy Roman Emperor allowed Innocent III's political political ability to capitalize on the power vacuum and assert his ambition. There is just a ton of political intrigue and story uh, to this whole thing, but we're going to leave that to your further research on your own. Uh, ultimately, by 1220, Henry VI's son and designated heir Frederick II was finally coronated as the, the new Holy Roman Emperor. And just a few interesting notes about Frederick II. Uh, he spoke six languages, German, Latin, French, Sicilian, Greek, and Arabic. He ruled the Holy Roman Emperor from his power base in Sicily. And Chris, tell us about what uh, historian Donald Detweiler has said about Frederick II. He wrote... He was a man of extraordinary culture and energy and ability. Called by a contemporary chronicler, Stuper Mundi, the wonder of the world, by Nietzsche, the first European, and by many historians, the first modern ruler, Frederick established in Sicily and southern Italy something very much like a modern, centrally governed kingdom with an efficient bureaucracy. So once again, upon Frederick II's death, like his father before him, succession becomes an issue. He had been excommunicated by the Pope multiple times, <laughs> which opened up for new elections for the King of Germany, which was synonymously becoming the King of the Romans and used as the designate elect to becoming the Holy Roman Emperor. However, other titles, such as the King of Sicily, were kind of, quote, up for grabs, right? So as the Pope was looking for alternatives to the Hohenstaufens, which was Frederick's family, he turned to King Henry III of England, suggesting that his younger son, Edmund, would be a good candidate. The claim to the throne was comes by way of Frederick II taking Henry III's sister, Isabella, as his third wife in 1235. So Edmund is the nephew by marriage of Frederick II, and 
was as good as any other option <laughs> for the Pope to try to counter against the Hohenstaufen. So this weak claim uh, to the throne would need to be backed up by military power and lots of money. So what did the Pope do? He asks for all that from Henry III. Now, there's one problem. <laughs> Henry didn't have the money to make that happen, and the legacy of Magna Carta was strong enough at this point to make Henry realize that he needed to ask for cons the consent of the barons before he could impose a tax to raise the funds that he wanted. This came by way of what's beginning to be called Parliament. Now, you would think that we would dedicate a whole episode to the birth of Parliament, but in reality, it's a bit of a murky transition. All of this is kind of the birth of Parliament. Yeah, uh, it Things don't happen just in the blink of an eye and say we crown the Parliament. It, it is an ongoing development, as you'll hear in, in history and political history. The Anglo-Saxon era had the Waitan, or White, uh, what is that word? We'll go Waitanagamont. Waitanagamont, fun word to say, can't say it, which we spoke brief, <laughs> briefly about in episode seven. With the Norman influence, this evolved into the Curia Regis, Latin for the king's court. These were both informal bodies whereby the king received counsel or advice from his key nobles. From the chaos of the anarchy to the absent rulers of Henry II and Richard to the tyranny of John. The Curia Regis, along with the Magna Carta, put the rule of Henry III into a situation where he had to be increasingly more inclusive of his nobles to get stuff done. The word parliament comes from the French parlor to speak. Parliament. Uh, parlement. Discussion. As early as the 1230s, Henry III was calling for parliamentum from his nobles to formally gather beyond the Curia Regis to discuss the matters of state. By the 1250s, it was acknowledged that a parliament was required to get stuff, well, at least taxation, done. And such meetings were occur occurring almost annually. So at this point, let's stop there and circle back and introduce Simon de Montfort. This rat bastard. <laughs> or hero. We'll see. <laughs> A little bit of both. Are you a royalist or what? Uh, so, you know, we, we briefly mentioned him at the end of uh, uh, the tour of our leading barons. And he's the grandson of Robert de Mauban, third Earl of Leicester. And upon the death of his uncle, another Robert de Mauban, in 1204, there's no remaining male heir. So the title is inherited by Simon's wife. Simon is a Frenchman, and he participated in that fourth crusade that we talked about in the beginning of our episode. And he opposed the Venetian attack on Zara and returned home early. And then he was a successful leader in what is called the Albigensian Crusade. This crusade was called for by Innocent III to attack heretics in southern France. Meanwhile, King John confiscated de Montfort's English lands and took the revenues for himself and put them in the oversight of the Earl of Chester. So Simon de Montfort then dies in the siege of Toulouse in 1218, leaving his sons Amory and Simon as co-heirs to his vast lands in France and the disputed lands in England. The brothers kind of come to a mutual agreement with uh, King Henry in uh, King Henry III in 1229, leaving Amory with the lands in France and Simon, Simon the Younger here, the lands in England and avoiding any notions of dual loyalty to both kings. So Simon becomes suddenly, slowly uh, becomes... Henry, one of the Henry III's trusted nobles over the course of the 1230s, becoming one of Lord Edward's godfathers, uh, and ends up marrying the king's sister, Eleanor, in 1238. And the title of Earl of Leicester is then fully restored to him around that time. But things start to turn sour just in the next year when Simon names the king himself as a guarantor of some of Simon's personal debt without the king's permission. Yeah, not not cool. <laughs> uh, de Montfort went on a crusade in what is to be known as the Barons' Crusade around 1240. He was in a contingent led by Richard of Cornwall. We need to introduce him as we skip past him in the list of Barons earlier. We did that because Richard was the younger brother of King Henry III, so he was a close relative of the royal family. Richard and Simon did not see much of any military action in the crusade, but they did help negotiate a peace settlement with the Muslims which returned the possessions of the Crusader states to their largest territory since Saladin captured Jerusalem in 1187. Both were recognized across Europe for their abilities, and in 1248, de Montfort was given a post in Gascony to oversee the territory on behalf of Lord Edward. Now, Gascony is uh, where the wine comes from, basically, mm -hmm. in France. So this is an incredibly important territory because, as you, as you may have heard, People didn't drink the water back then. They drank wine or maybe some fermented drink. 
Um, and so the best wine in the world came from Gascony. So he's being put in charge of something that's really important. And and this at this time is the last remaining land on the continent held right. by the King of England as well. So he's capable and somewhat brutal, which usually go hand in hand. And this contributed to both de Montfort's power base and began to drive animosity between the Earl and the King's son, Matt. Yeah. So let's fast forward a, a, about 10 years, a little forward to the Parliament of 1258 now. So, you know, recall, uh, it, it, you know, the barons are starting to get dissatisfied with Henry III's influence from the outsiders, right? The, 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 those uh, aliens, the Savoyards from his wife's family, the Lusignons, also known as the Poitevins from his mother's family. And then he's got his attempts to this ridiculous attempt to try to secure the kingdom of Italy for his son, Edmund. Uh, other factors are compounding the dissatisfaction. We have a famine that happened in, in the prior two years. Uh, Henry III's continuing promises of going on crusade, trying to raise money and then never going on crusade. His failed military campaigns in France, big expenditures to support his you know, piety and near worship of Edward the Confessor and rebuilding a Westminster Abbey. Um, and so he shows up at Parliament in 1258 and, and meets a little surprise in, in Oxford and his barons uh, initiate a coup and force him to accept a new uh, version of leadership. And the kingdom is, is then turned over to a council of 24 barons, 12 appointed by the king, 12 by the barons. And then this council of 24 selects a council, sub-council of 15, who run the day-to-day -day operations of the government along with the king. And it further establishes that the royal offices that we've talked about in the past, including Chief Justiciar and Lord Chancellor, would be elected by the council, not appointed by the king. And further, it's established that a parliament would need to be called and meet three times a year. All of these reforms are known in history as the provisions of Oxford. Now, these provisions were confirmed and extended the following year at the October Parliament of 1259. Those are aptly named the provisions of Westminster. The king brokered favor with Louis the Ninth of France by formally acknowledging the loss of territory in France by the Treaty of Paris in 1259. And the Pope gave Henry III a boost in 1261 when a papal bull annulled the provisions of Oxford and Westminster. The baronial faction retreated a bit, but began military action in 1263. With the country on the verge of all-out civil war, the sides appealed to arbitration to Louis IX, who sided fully with King Henry III in the Mies of Amiens. In 1264, dissatisfied Simon de Montfort and his most radical barons proceeded in an all-out war known as the Second Barons War. Now, military history is not our thing here. We are no Dan Carlins. But we do need to hit the two major highlights of the Second Barons War so that we can put them into the political context. We should also note that many English histories do not devote this much time, relatively speaking, to King Henry III's reign. We are focusing on this snapshot of 40, 50 years in this episode because it is really a major advancement in balancing political power between the king and his subjects while cementing the legacy of the spirit, if not the letter, of the Magna Carta. So there are two battles that really are key in the Second Baron's War. What is the first one, Matt? Yeah, so we'll start with the Battle of Lewis uh, before we get to the Battle of Evesham. So the high point for the barons uh, opposing the king, and who are led by Simon de Montfort, come with the Battle of Lewis in May of 1264. So in this battle, the outnumbered rebels faced a direct pitched battle against the royal forces and, and secured a surprise victory with King Henry III, Richard of Cornwall, and Lord Edward all taken as prisoners of war. Henry's reduced to a puppet king under de Montfort's control, as laid out in going back to revisit the provisions of Oxford, while Richard and Edward are held securely in a castle under guard. And a treaty known as the Mies of Lewis is then, uh, has been lost to history, but essentially sets these terms of the royal surrender. Now, eventually, Lord Edward escapes. And what happens next, Chris? Uh, he rallies his allies, notably the younger barons of the Western counties. The rebel alliance has begun to weaken as many lords see de Montfort's actions while in power as self-serving. And less, as most revolutions go, he turns in to be a corrupt uh, dictator. Uh, and the the Lord, Lord Edward leads his supporters into the next key battle, the Battle of Evesham. Uh, in the summer of 1265, the Royalists are victorious and De Montfort is killed in the battle. He's unceremoniously dismembered uh, 
as one is, as an example for other rebels. Uh, there's never been a ceremonial dismembering. Uh, yeah, if you we, we'll keep it a little family maybe, friendly, but maybe if you go, William if you go get the details, um, he it, it's a little bit more unceremonious than usual. Yeah, I mean, we'll leave it at that. <laughs> the death of Edward the Third. Um, in the aftermath, most of De Montfort supporters ultimately find refuge in the cath- castle at Kenilworth. King Henry's inclination and in initial policy is that of ret- uh, retribution. But guided by his son, who has shown some flexibility in his political leanings over the crisis of the last several years, the king does find compromise. And the dictum of Kenilworth was issued in 1266 to attempt to finalize peace. The rebel barons were mostly forgiven, and this was followed by the statues of Marlborough, in 1267, which reconfirmed royal power, but still acknowledged the Magna Carta and Charter of the Forest, among many other provisions. There are a few items of the statues which still remain in force today, making them the oldest statue laws in England. Now, King Henry III would go under rule until his death in 1272. He never went on crusade while his rival Louis IX went on both the 7th and 8th crusades. The French king died in 1270 while on crusade in North Africa. He was canonized as St. Louis, yes, St. Louis, in 1297. So, Matt, what do we need to expect in episode 12 of the History of Modern Politics? Yeah, so in the next episode, uh, we're going to pick up a variety of different hodgepodge topics that are going to help us set the scene for the next 100 years. So, you know, we've we've largely avoided uh, getting into detail about Wales and Scotland. We're going to try to pick up briefly the history of, of those territories as they become very important in the reign of our next king, King Edward I. Um, we're going to look at the development of law in a little bit more specificity, which is obviously a, a, a very important foundation from a political standpoint. Uh, we're going to look at banking and the Jews and the Italian merchant class and, and finance and things like that, as, as that all also ties into what's going to happen over the next um, several decades, couple hundred years here. And I think the last piece that we'll also pick up in on the next episode is just a little bit of what's going on to the North East of France in Flanders. We've talked about Flanders here and there and the low countries, but they start to play an increasingly important role uh, in the next uh, century amongst King Edwards, the first Edward, the second, and then Edward, the third. All right. Well, thank you for listening to the History of Modern Politics. On behalf of Matt Whitliff and myself, Chris Spangle, we appreciate you listening. And if you've got something of value, please give value back by signing up at thehistoryofmodernplus.com. And thank you to all of the We Are Libertarians Podcast Network patrons for helping support and make this program possible. Thank you again, and we will see you again in two weeks here on the History of Modern Politics. Thanks, Chris.